let us stand and have our call to worship together, please. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Let us pray. Great and merciful God, clear the clutter of everyday life from our minds, that we might receive your word into our hearts to be lived out in your world. May your word guide us in trusting you and your ways. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Our scripture reading comes from the 23rd chapter of Job. Let us hear its message meant for us this day. Job is responding to one of his friends, and we know that the friends have been very critical of Job and the reasons for his sufferings. Then Job replied, Even today my complaint is bitter. His hand is heavy in spite of my groaning. If only I knew where to find him. If only I could go to his dwelling. I would state my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would find out what he would answer me and consider what he would say. Would he oppose me with great power? No, he would not press charges against me. There an upright man could present his case before him, and I would be delivered forever from my judge. But if I go to the east, he is not there. If I go to the west, I cannot find him. When he is at work in the north, I do not see him. When he turns to the south, I catch no glimpse of him. But he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. My feet have closely followed his steps. I have kept to his way without turning aside. I have not departed from the commands of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my daily bread. But he stands alone, and who can oppose him? He does whatever he pleases. He carries out his degree against me and many such plans he still has in store. That is why I am terrified before him when I think of all this. I fear him. God has made my heart faint. The Almighty has terrified me. Yet I am not silenced by the darkness, by the thick darkness that covers my face. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. When bad things happen to good people is lived out in the book of Job. 
The entire book presents us with a lesson that even in dark times, hang on. Hang on to trust and faith in the Almighty Shaddai. I am sure that you remember much of Job's story, if not all of it. On Sunday, June 20, I was your pulpit guest, and the lectionary text for the Old Testament was from Job. Guess what? Today's Old Testament lesson is from the book of Job. So, we get to take another peek into the light and the happenings of Job. Readers of the book of Job sometimes get lost among the pages of speeches, pain, and suffering. Now, the storyline for the book of Job is found in the first two chapters and the very last chapter, 42. And everything in between is speeches. Speeches by Job, his friends, his wife, and finally, God. And if this is kept in mind, reading Job becomes easier. However, do not take this as an endorsement to read only the first two chapters and the last chapter of the book of Job because doing so would mean missing the emotional roller coaster ride of Job, which provides we modern readers with an example of how to hang on even in the dark times of life. Now, a quick review will remind us that Job was a man who was blameless and upright in the sight of God. He feared, or a better word is probably reverenced God, and he shunned evil. He was the greatest man among the people of the East in both wealth and reputation. But unknown to Job, he was involved in a cosmic test, some might say a contest, that was proposed in heaven and played out on earth as an extreme test of faith. The best man on earth suffered the worst calamities. Satan had said to God that Job was only what he was, blameless and upright, because God had blessed him with great wealth, thousands of animals, many servants, ten children, and respect among all the people of the land and that Job and others like him only love God because of the good things God provides. And furthermore, Satan said to God, if all these things are taken away, Job's faith in God would disappear along with his great wealth and his good health. So crucial questions at the onset are these. Will Job turn against God? Will Job remain faithful to God regardless of his circumstances? Will he continue to believe in a just and merciful God? Now we especially those who wear a white crown of glory, we will remember Paul Harvey. So we are like Paul Harvey. We know the rest of the story. And we know that Job didn't turn against God, but 
he still had to endure a difficult journey to restoration. And his restoration account appears in chapter 42 and is summarized in the words of verse 12. The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the first. But at this point, when we're joining Job from chapter 23, Job desired to know why God and where are you? Many of us do as Job did. When life rolls over us, smashes us to the ground, and smothers our hope, our peace, and our joy, and leaves a deep, dark hole in the middle of our being. We want the answers to the same questions Job had. Why, God? Where are you, God? How can I survive this? And like all grieving persons, even us, Job went through emotional cycles. He whined, he exploded, he controlled, he collapsed into self-pity and depression. And these emotions are noted in his speech in chapter 23 when we hear such words as bitter, groaning, where can I, wherever I go, regardless of the direction, I cannot find God. It seems that Job is ready to take God on, yet he wonders, will he ever find God? And then he seems to tremble over what might happen if he really does locate God. And it's in this chapter that we see the tension that exists between the patient Job that we've heard about all of our lives and the impatient Job, which I personally have never heard about. It is here in this chapter especially that we see Job as a real person. It is here that we realize he is not some kind of plaster saint who suffers without complaint or concerns. He struggled with his emotions and feelings just as we do. And from Job, we learn if the best of the best had questions about faith sufferings and trust that it's all right for us to ask why. Not as an accusation against God, but for understanding. It is easier to accept situations when we understand the whys. We, like Job, may allow our minds to be prejudiced against God because of sufferings. It's during these down times, these emotional trauma times, that the evil one is a subtle tempter who attempts to pull us away from our values, our faith, and even our God. He knows when we are angry, when we are discouraged, and when we have sagging spirits. And he works to unravel all that we hold dear and sacred. And it is during these times we need to anchor ourselves and hang on tighter than ever to our belief and our trust in God. And Job said it this way, and here again, verses 16 and 17. God has made my heart faint. The Almighty has terrified me. 
Yet I am not silenced by the darkness, by the thick darkness that covers my face. In contemporary words, Job was hanging on. And his life accounts give us an example of hanging on in difficult times. And it is during these difficult times that we need comfort and we need encouragement. Yet Job received neither from his friends or his family. And even though he tends to waffle and weave back and forth, he never gave in to believing he had committed a great sin that had brought chaos in the form of death and destruction upon him. He held on. Now, I remember several years ago in my other life as an elementary teacher of having a very stressful year. Now, that may surprise you. I had two things in my classroom that got me through the day. Well, truth be told, got me through the year. One item was a photo cube on my desk. And instead of photos, I placed the words to the hymn, Because He Lives, I Can Face Tomorrow, by Bill and Gloria Gaither. And the second item was a humorous poster on the bulletin board. <clears throat> and the poster showed a terrified cat clinging to a rope that swung in midair with the caption off, hang on baby, Friday's coming. Sometimes we may feel like that cat hanging on as life swings us in midair, right? Some of you, and myself as well, are on journeys that take us where we really don't want to go. Perhaps, like Job, there are those who have lost it all. Wealth, family, and health. Perhaps a loved one has died, or a relationship has broken. There's an empty seat at the dinner table, in the pew beside you, at ball games, at family reunions, and so many other places. And we, like Job, long for release from the anxiety of our loss. We long for a peace that cannot be manufactured. But for us, for we who claim the name Christian, peace comes from knowing Jesus and believing that because he lives, we can face tomorrow. And we long to be gathered close and to be healed of broken hearts, broken bodies, and overcome the surrounding darkness which sufferings hold us in a grip. We desire to be bathed in the light and to be released from sadness. And there's a promise of hope that is uttered by Job in chapter 19, verse 28. And I did share this with you on June 20. And I want to share it again. It is my favorite verse from the book of Job, where he says, I know my Redeemer lives, and that in the end he will stand upon the earth. Job never was trying to hide his despair and anguish, but thanks be to God, his trials and sufferings did not crush his hope. And as the child who is suffering for, from cancer says in the St. Jude commercial, hope means never giving up. And that's where we need to be. That's where we need to find ourselves in the center of hope that is granted to us 
by the one who suffered greatly, Jesus the Christ, so that you and I could be people of hope and to understand that whatever comes our way, we never give up. We do not grieve as those without hope, nor do we walk the journeys of life alone. God is with us. The author of the poem Footprints boldly declares that in difficult times of life, God carries us. He is not absent, as Job thought, nor is he absent when we may think so. Emmanuel, God is with us every step of all our journeys, whether they are good or not so good. Now, when you arrived this morning, you were given a ribbon of red and green joined by a knot. Perhaps you wondered what kind of craziness is our pulpit guest planning. And I wonder no longer, it's about to be revealed. We know that the traditional colors of Christmas are red and green, and you may be thinking, I want to join the department stores in doing a jump start starting Christmas celebrations before Halloween or Thanksgiving is here. But I propose to you that we look at these ribbons a bit differently. Let's let the red remind us of the blood that Christ shed for the forgiveness of our sins. And let us let the green remind us of the promise of eternal life. Now, I invite you to hold the ribbon in one hand and move your fingers from the top of the ribbon toward the bottom. Did you feel the silkiness of the ribbon as you started downward? Then you encountered a knot a bump, which serves to remind us that life is like a ribbon. Everything is wonderful, smooth, and just fine, like it was with Job. Then suddenly, there is a bump in the road, a bend in the road, a detour, and life takes a different direction. And most likely, that direction is one we really don't want to go. And perhaps it is even a place that seems to crush the very life out of us. And reactions vary. They're as different as people are. I confess to you that I cry. And I pray, beating on the doors of heaven for understanding, for release, and for peace. Sometimes those things come. Sometimes they do not. But the promise of Scripture remains. Come unto me, those who are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. The grass withers, flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. And believe the good news that comes from the lips of Jesus the Christ himself. In my Father's house are many rooms, most of us would say, or mansions. And I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. The news is good. Hang on, baby. We have the blessed assurance that 
Jesus lives, and because he lives, you and I can face tomorrow. Thanks be to God, we never walk alone. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I invite you to join me in prayer. Thank you, Almighty God, for your servant, Job, and for the lessons of courage, hope, and trust we see in his life. When we are discouraged because of life happenings and sufferings, help us to remember his story and not beat ourselves up when we question or scream or cry out, Where are you, God? Help us to know that it is better to know and trust in you, Almighty God, it should all, than to know all the answers. And may we leave this sacred place with hope, peace, and joy restored, knowing that because Jesus lives, we can face tomorrow. And even in the darkness that may surround us, we can hang on to your promises. Amen and amen. And I invite you to stand and join in the singing of our closing hymn, Blessed Assurance. All who are around you stand in need of helping hands or encouraging words or loving care. Be that person who walks with those who are on a difficult journey. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, leave this place to be the only Jesus others may see. This will bring honor to his name and I think put a smile on his face. And the Lord will bless and keep you while we are absent one from the other. Amen and amen.